If you've been here for at least a couple of weeks, you might have watched my videos on horseshoe theory and radicalization. This video is a kind of part three to that series, and as such, it's mostly a video on ideas and ideology and propaganda. You know, like most of this channel. You've probably heard the term marketplace of ideas before. It conjures up the image of the many philosophical ideas out there competing for your attention, and the ones that win are the ones that are the most popular. It's a popularity contest, right? History is determined by people choosing from among philosophies, right? Sort of, but sort of not. In the theoretical marketplace, you'd be able to browse ideologies, compare their merits, their claims, and their histories. So, is that where we get our beliefs? Have you ever been to this marketplace? Today, like Juan Ponce de Leon, we're going looking for the fabled marketplace of ideas. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. But first, do you have hair? Does the hair grow out of your face? Are you a dude? If you answered yes to any two of those three questions, you need the Dudescaper. The Dudescaper is just like any other razor, but it's got dude in the name. So obviously it's manly. You can buy one today at dudescaper.com slash it had to be said is the best YouTube channel I've ever watched bar none and begin feeling like a dude. One interesting tenet of marketplace theory is that like the free market for business, a free market of ideas would inevitably lead to good outcomes. Well, that argument begs the question. We have to assume not only that the free market exists, but that it's beneficial. There's a huge pile of propaganda behind those beliefs, and I've made several videos on this channel debunking it, but you could click here to watch the latest one. Suffice it to say, whether you call it either, either the market for commodities or the market for ideas the free market, they have the same outcomes. They both end up being controlled by the people with all the money. They use billions of dollars a year of that money to hire people to tell us their version of how the world works, and the rest of us are supposed to believe it. Historically, when people have used the term marketplace of ideas, they assumed if people were allowed to speak freely, the truth would come to light and be accepted by all, or at least by leading intellectuals, and the best ideas would ultimately win out. Reason will prevail! Oh, yeah. We decided also that we would say reason will prevail every time someone Reason says, will prevail! The thing is, Mill and the other liberal philosophers didn't count on a press and a public discourse wholly owned by rich people and used to distract, indoctrinate, and divide us. They didn't foresee we'd be surrounded on all sides by media intended to squeeze ever more money and compliance out of us. The market has concentrated media ownership in the hands of a few companies owned by a few thousand shareholders. Nor did they know back then the university would also comply in keeping radical ideas marginal. Where would you get access to any ideas outside the basic liberal conservative Disney paradigm? Only online. And only if you hear about it, and only if you're curious and open-minded, and even then, you're so accustomed to the devil you know, it might still seem preferable to a theoretical devil you don't. And if someone with a dissenting view gets too influential, the powerful have their ways of dealing with them. They might just co-opt them by paying them well. They might kill them, like they did to MLK and Fred Hampton. Or they might just silence them. According to Wikipedia, The first reference to the free trade in ideas within the competition of the market appears in 1919 uh, at U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. 
Which is weird, because it's presumably the same court that thought charging Eugene Debs under the Espionage Act for giving speeches wasn't a violation of that free trade and competition. There's never been any kind of free market or even playing field for speech. Today we assume all ideas should be brought to light and debated by everybody, when often what that means is a few really loud people with good media skills and big financial backers can control the conversation. So the conversations we need about how the system works and what to do about it never take place. Instead of just agreeing Black Lives Mattered, we had to listen to self-righteous white people say, but what about black-on-black -black crime? Instead of just leaving people alone, people have to discuss trans people all the time to make shit up about them and scare others into thinking something has to be done about these people. Not everything has to be debated, actually. Try accepting people's existence and experience and minding your own business. The propaganda is full of metaphors for politics. You hear about horseshoes and marketplaces and planes that need both the left wing and the right wing, and most of these metaphors mislead rather than illuminate. What would a marketplace of ideas look like? Well, you might imagine a market with tables and stalls and displays and all the different ideas have their respective tables and they're all equally on display. But that wouldn't reflect any existing market for philosophy or ideology. If ideas were a marketplace, liberalism would have an enormous stall right at the front that promises to satisfy all your needs. By the way, do you know what I mean by liberalism? If you call yourself a conservative and therefore don't believe in liberalism, you're probably wrong. If you've never Googled liberalism before, or better yet, read books on it, now's the time. It's a philosophical, economic, political system. The dominant system in the world for at least a hundred years now. So its stall would be huge. It would be like Walmart. Most people would just shop there and not even browse the rest of the market. They might not even realize there is a market. Around the liberalism stall would be its subsidiaries like capitalism, nationalism, white supremacy, and social democracy. They'd also have prominent displays of their own, perhaps propped up by boards borrowed from the liberalism booth. There would be no stall for conservatism because conservatism is not a coherent ideology. The conservatives would be halfway between the liberal booth and the white supremacist booth, insisting they were neither. There would be a stall in the far right corner for Nazism. All the other stalls would say they hate them and someone should do something, but secretly everyone would be fascinated by them. The left side of the marketplace wouldn't be the entire left half of the marketplace, but maybe mm, the far corner. Everyone there would be arguing with each other. Marxism would have a stall, but it would be constantly being pelted with garbage from all the other stalls. There would be a guy with no stall walking around waving a banner for someone named Chairman Gonzalo. The owners of the market would put anarchism in a closet, and none of the other stalls would say anything. You would only even know anything about it if you walked in there by accident looking for the bathroom. And nihilists either wouldn't turn up or would walk around flipping over tables. And so they should. Like all markets, the market for thought is dominated by a few players who have the most money and power and use it to keep out the competition. There are several ways of referring to the dominant ideas of today. Liberalism, liberal democracy, capitalism, imperialism, nationalism, patriarchy, white supremacy. You've heard all those. The worship of money and authority. The belief in technological progress to save us from climate change. All these things overlap, even if in theory they contradict each other. 
Liberalism is supposed to be based on liberty, after all, but in practice, this liberty tends to just mean the power to own all the media we consume and shut out dissenters. The voices expressing the dominant ideas become so loud and ubiquitous, there's no room for any others. You don't have to think of yourself as a capitalist or white supremacist or misogynist to express views that are informed by those ideologies. It's unconscious. You're affected by them whether you want to be or not. And when you never hear any different dissenting voices, you don't realize there might be people who think differently, and they might be right. Constantly exposing oneself to news or to people who don't know what they're talking about could rapidly indoctrinate anyone who doesn't know how to question it. It could just be one guy on Facebook you used to know who's now talking about how we need to stop immigration because the white race is being replaced. If you don't know it's all just fascist bullshit, you might fall for it. You might say, well, I'm not a racist or anything, but we should do this thing to people based on their race, nationality, or religion, and not see a contradiction. After all, we grew up being told it's fine to discriminate against people based on their nationality, because that's what borders and immigration policy do. A lot of us learn one religion as a child, and that other religions are wrong and bad, and their followers maybe aren't as good people as our followers, so it's okay to discriminate against them, too. And even people like me, who grew up knowing it's wrong to hate someone for their skin color, might unconsciously stereotype and treat people differently nonetheless. We've been conditioned to think simply, to stereotype, and to accept justifications for why people are worse off, without regard to how external eff factors affect them, or us, and the way we think. We learn it's good to force people, that's the whole purpose of government. We learn from police and military, it's okay to lock up and kill people if we decide they're wrong. We learn to accept huge wealth disparities, because pff, it's normal. So. You know, apparently some people just deserve to own pretty much everything, and others deserve poverty. Why? Because money. So despite all your parents' and teachers' words, we learn that force and violence and discrimination are just fine, actually, as long as the people doing it are in authority. In fact, the whole liberalism stall could just be a smiling police officer saying, Come to liberalism! You're free to do anything, anytime, unless I say otherwise. I've made some videos on why we believe what we believe about all these topics, so check the description for some links. Liberalism is so strongly embedded in the U.S. and the international system more widely that the current rise in right-wing politics might possibly turn over the table and prompt a backlash from more liberal forces of the ruling class that leads to the right becoming fractured and dispirited for another generation, you know, like in the 40s and 50s. But I think it's more likely they'll become pretty successful in the short term. So, you know, defend yourselves. Andrew Yang is the latest person attempting to create a third party in the U.S. to challenge the two that half of eligible voters hate. He seems like a newcomer to the marketplace, but he's waving pamphlets for ideas we've always been aware of. Let's look at the Forward Party's website. Americans can fix any problem, okay, just silly patriotic pandering. Forward is approaching a platform differently. The rigid, top-down, one-size-fits-all platforms are drifting toward the fridges. Fringes. Well, okay, but what do you think a policy is, if not a rigid, top-down threat of violence that everyone has to conform to? What, what else is a policy? What, what other kinds of policies are there? You could have no policy and abolish laws on a certain thing, but it doesn't look like they're going to do that. 
and it says free people are their pri their priorities right free people revitalize the culture wow love those words great words individual choice reject hate remove barriers wow awesome totally different from all the other parties right thriving communities of course it says the word community nowadays all advertising has to say the word community in it and a vibrant democracy you know we're it's it's a government that works you see people will have more say in our future so liberalism Andrew would be working at the liberalism stall, telling people to go to his liberalism stall, assuring you he's a new strain of liberal. He uses all the same words as the liberal, moderate, centrist third parties do, and I'm guessing he will be as successful as all of them have been. This is also from the website. So what else, what else do they say? Diverse thinking is required. Hmm. Okay, so so you're going to be bringing together like people from all over, from all walks of life. Hmm. Well, we're going to deal with that later. Bottom up, not top down. Okay, so again, what kind of sense does that make? Are you going to have a policy or not? It says we won't dictate a rigid top-down policy platform and expect it to work for all Americans. Does that mean you'll have no federal policies at all? Is that how that works? Because yeah, a policy means it's, you know, it's going to impose its will on everybody. Are you going to have some kind of policy that has so many exceptions that anyone can do anything and interpret it any way they want? Because if so, what's the point of the policy? Are you going to just have statewide policies? No, none of this makes any sense. If it were really bottom up, there would be no policy. And the people would just kind of decide things for themselves, make up their own individual policy, as it were. But obviously, the forward party's not proposing that. More listening, less talking. We're going to work for you. Again, totally different from anything all the other ones have ever said, right? Work together, not against. Collaborative solutions, see? Grace and tolerance. Pick people back up rather than knocking people down. We won't cancel people or cast them out of the party for not falling in line. Well, okay, so again, you're not gonna have any policy at all on that. It's kind of weird. It says here, the forward party will strive for collaborative solutions. Make sure they work and try something else if they don't. Well, what do all those things mean? Who decides what works? Any policies can be said to work. The question is, how do they work? Who benefits and who loses? And, and I think I know what collaborative solutions mean. So let me ask you this. When you attempt to bring together people from different classes to form a party platform, whose policies do you think they'll end up adopting? Will it be the policies that benefit the workers? Or will it be the policies that benefit the people with money? Who will be expected to compromise? The workers or the owners? What do you think the odds are that a big tent party with any chance of succeeding in US politics would end up adopting all the policies rich people want. This is the marketplace of ideas in action. Rich people and the propaganda that serves them have always led the conversation. They only include anyone else for photo opportunities. After the camera leave, it's out the door with you and in with the lobbyists. It'll be like all markets, nominally free to enter and compete, but already so skewed in favor of the big players with the best marketing as to make it impossible to challenge them. There is one more really important question that I'd like to at least address in my brief way. How do you get to the truth? I've got my perspective only. 
Um, but probably the first thing I would say is subject all your beliefs and notions to scrutiny, including your own. Learn from various sources. Read reviews and criticism of the people you're reading. Test the books and whatever you're learning from against each other. Learn logic and test what you read against logic. It helps you recognize poor arguments. Find people on social media working in the field you're learning about. In fact, find lots of people in the field because they might be calling out the fakers in their fields so you know who to avoid, or at least you're aware of criticism of them. Criticism from some people doesn't make someone wrong on everything, after all. Uh, just like being right about one thing doesn't mean you know other things. They might just be broken clocks. You know what they say about broken clocks, right? Throw them out, just use your phone. Listen with an open mind, especially to criticism of your ideas. Arguing is fine, but surely the goal of an argument should be to reach the truth, not to win. Listen to the people most affected by the things you're learning about. Listen to people fighting back against the things you used to believe in. Don't be put off just because solutions seem extreme. We live in a world of extremes that sometimes requires extreme responses. The solutions to our problems will never be the ones suggested by the propaganda, like throwing your weight behind the latest candidate for office. They will come from concerned people and communities fighting for their liberation. Those are the people I listen to. I can't thank them enough for everything they've taught me. Although, you know, I do send them a few bucks when I have it. More important, though, is that we work together in solidarity, fight for liberation, and transition seamlessly into the end of this video. Thanks for watching. Here are some of the video titles I came up with in the shower.